Good day, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Cybersecurity, Keeping Ahead of the Game with Microfocus. Next slide, please. Today's Feb Vivid webinar is brought to you by the Vivid Automation and Cloud Builder Special Interest Group and the Vivid Security Special Interest Group. The SIG leaders are Darren Blumenthal, Accenture. He is the Automation and Cloud Builders Sp uh, Special Interest Group leader. Soma Ismail Bola, he is with IT Incept, Security and Privacy SIG leader. Jamil Kusugal, Austere Technology Services, and he's also a SIG leader for the Security and Privacy SIG. And Uwe Mönig, CEO at SecCloud IT, and he's also a Security and Privacy SIG leader. My name is Annemarie Stuyver. I am uh, a Vivid staff member and I support the Vivid local user groups and the special interest groups. And I am your host today. Today's speakers, Darren Blumenthal, Ecosystem Solution Architect at Accenture. He's a passionate technologist and enthusiastic solution architect. He has over 22 years of experience in the IT industry and his hobbies are close-up magician and he's a martial art instructor. Stan Wiseman, he's also a security, uh, he's a security strategist at Microfocus and also a speaker today. Um, he's leader for Microfocus Security Products Business Solutions Team in the United States, and he is responsible for providing thought leadership and insight regarding the ever-changing global threat landscape. He has over 30 years of information security experience and has applied security best practices to operating systems, networks, systems, software, and organizations. Like Darren, he likes martial arts, but he has the brown belt. Next slide, please. Now some quick housekeeping. Today's live session is intended for all Vivid members. The on-demand recording, slide deck, and questions and answers will be posted on the Vivid website, visible for all Vivid members. Additionally, today's slide deck, questions and answers, and on-demand recording will be made available to you. We will send you a link via email once they are posted to the Vivid website. If you have questions as we go along, please type and send them in using the questions pane in the webinar control panel, shown on the next slide. Here you can see a picture of the GoToWebinar control panel that usually appears in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. To submit a question, make sure the questions pane is expanded and type in your question and then click on send. So let's get started. I will now pass it over to Darren. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie, and welcome to everyone on the call. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. We would like to take this opportunity, as you can see 2019 on the screen, to wish everyone on the call a very happy start to the year and everything of the best for the next three quarters of 2019. What a year this is proving to be. I'm honored to be joined here on this webinar by Stan Wisserman, Chief Security Strategist and Leader at Microfocus Security. Also to note, this is the first time that the Cloud Builders SIG and the Security SIG are co-hosting a webinar. So welcome to all attendees from both SIGs. We have a lot more in common than you think. So today we stand at a technological, political and environmental inflection point. Two decades of technology growth has generated an enormous amount of physical and digital clutter. And the demand on the planet's resources mirrors the demand on two other precious human resources, our time and our attention. And as a result, everybody are doing some serious soul searching this year about where they stand in all of it, which leads us to the overall meta theme for 2019, the search for value and relevance. But everywhere you look, security is part of that discussion. So today we're gonna to be talking about four key trends in the security landscape. We've called it be the hunter, not the hunted. We'll be taking you through how Microfocus can address each one of these um, security trends. So that's with security analytics. Then we have visibility. Now you see it, now you don't. 
because you can't protect what you cannot see. We'll be talking about how to protect your house with data-driven conversations. And then lastly, rethinking the perimeter. We'll be taking you through cases where identity-powered security is key. And then we'll, uh, if there is time, and I hope we'll cover it all, but we'll open it up to um, Q&A. So without further ado, let's start with our first security trend. Be the hunter, not the hunted. I don't know if all of you have had a chance to watch this film, but this is a movie that I truly loved. It's a classic tale of cat and mouse. The good guy has to catch the bad guy, but the bad guy was once a good guy, and now he's turned bad because he saw how bad it was to be good in a war. And the good guy used to teach the bad guy, so the bad guy knows all the good guy's tactics. So you st soon you start sympathizing with the bad guy, but in the end, the good guy needs to win, right? So not sure if you remember, but in 2018, we had a huge amount of data breaches and hacks and customers trust in companies that were collecting and using the data was not only dented but also burned last year's events left huge numbers of people feeling used and vulnerable i read somewhere that 75 percent of people said that they won't buy a product from a company no matter how great the product is if they don't trust that company to protect their data and on another note, I read that 60% of people ranked that a, a war was less concerning than cybersecurity. So you can see how security is key to all our conversations. And that's why I've brought this in there for the um, Cloud Builder SIG, because as you architect um, data centers and hybrid clouds and cloud environments, you have to keep security in mind front and center. And today's webinar is going to show you how MicroFocus will address these kind of um, of trends and uh, how to mitigate against them. So as you already know, there's many types of attacks, such as malware, denial of service, SQL injection, cross-site scripting. These are the kind of things that hit the Marriott hotels, where in November last year, 500 million records of customers' data, including credit card and passport info, leaked since 2014. So this was happening for four years without them knowing about it. And then, as you know, with Facebook in October, about 29 million records were compromised due to third-party site scrapers that were just uh, gleaning the site for people's information. So what is security analytics? So think of it this way. How do you maneuver through a crowded street surrounded by self-absorbed pedestrians, fast-moving bikes, cars, buses, uh, traffic lights, angry dogs, hungry pigeons, and uh, whatever that is on the floor. So standing on the street corner, you receive a lot of data via your senses, right? Your sight, sound, your smell, and then your brain processes them. You do a quick analysis based on your experience, and then you determine your outcomes. So do you stop? When should you go? The route looks dangerous. Is it threatening enough? Are you trained in martial arts like I am? <laughs> Can you run a five second mile and escape any potential danger? Or are you the, in the biggest, safest vehicle on the road and you don't actually care who gets in your way? So in our cybersecurity world, we can discuss each one of these in terms of use cases. Specifically, the classic infamous cases of Spectre and Meltdown. Not, not Spectre, the worst, or one of the worst 007 movies to date. I actually quite enjoyed it, but the reviews weren't so generous. But in early 2018, um, news surfaced publicly about two hardware vulnerabilities that had the potential of exploiting critical vulnerabilities in pretty much every system on the planet. Not just talking desktops, laptops, and cloud servers, but I'm talking smartphones and basically all modern processes, the very things that run our lives these days. And then there was Meltdown, another hardware vulnerability that allowed rogue processors to read all memory, even if it's not authorized to do so. So how can we, mit how can we mitigate against this with microfocus? So I've got Stan Visserman with me, and he's going to tell us exactly how microfocus addresses this from a security analytic 
this perspective. Hey, thanks, Darren. And I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to both the cloud and security six today. Um, and I'm going to have to check out that movie Hunted. I can't believe I haven't seen it. Um, but security analytics, as you've noted so well, is, is certainly a big trend. And, um, you know, it's certainly something we're reflecting in our portfolio as well. And what I wanted to start with, just this, you know, level set, is to provide a, uh, a perspective of our portfolio and what we address. And so this slide provides an overview of our security, um, cybersecurity technology areas that we focus on. And you'll notice at the bottom of that slide, we include analytics and machine learning. And we're taking steps to integrate analytics and machine learning throughout our security portfolio, actually throughout our whole micro-focused portfolio as far as machine learning, um, to drive greater insights and decision-making. Uh, so let me share um, how we're doing this in some of our technology domains. Can you go to the next slide, please? So, so as you pointed out, um, with the high frequency of advanced threats and these threats becoming more stealthy and more more challenging like specter and meltdown um, you know some organizations are implementing a threat hunting capability either within their current security operations center working environment or in a separate hunt team that feeds these findings back into the SOC. and so as you ingest data as represented by the blue on the left hand of side of the slide um, you can then correlate a bit of data or known threats with a SIM. Um, but you can do more discovery by leveraging analytics and machine learning to then help prioritize your events for your analysts so they can know what to focus on and identify these threats. Go ahead and go to the next slide. As you can see on the top right, ArcSight ESM, which is our SIM, uh, provides real-time correlation needed to uh, needed by SOX to help it quickly identify known threats. So those are some of the challenges they're facing. Like how do they identify known threats quickly and reduce the dwell time in their environments? A couple of years ago, we started rolling out ArcSign Investigate, which provides structured data analytics and is built on Vertica, our columnar database. Now, at the bottom, you'll see we have a new addition to our portfolio. It's a firm that has a focus on leveraging both supervised and unsupervised machine learning called Intercept. We closed the acquisition with Intercept on the 15th of February, and they'll be running standalone through um, this year, FY19. Um, Intercept has already been a technology OEM partner working with our ArcSight team. Um, but we'll also be looking for ways in which we can leverage their machine learning IP and capabilities with the rest of our portfolio. So I'm going to spend a few more minutes on what we're doing with Investigate and highlight some of its benefits. So go ahead and go to the next slide, Darren. While setting up a hunt team may be a desired uh, target state, uh, like we've talked about, um, Hunt tools are often complex and require uh, a separate, more advanced tier of resources, which is difficult to find and retain, honestly. Um, our site investigate delivers out-of-the-box visuals for security-specific use cases, and this helps level one analysts draw meaningful insights for threat investigation without having to know and create the best graphs and visuals for each scenario. And also, more senior analysts in level two and level three can take advantage of this as well. Our site investigate takes advantage of Vertica, um, a high performance analytics platform to drive analytical power of the investigative process. Next slide. Investigate supports complex visualizations quickly with uh, drill down capabilities, quick filters, easy field selection for charts. Um, you can come, you know, the, the challenge that we have in the SOC is that coming through thousands of events is pretty inefficient. That's why we have a SIM. Um, but we also want to do searches and uh, 
augment what we're doing with some of these hunt capabilities. And when we're doing that, it can be very time consuming and prone to error. Um, with investigate analysts can sift through large volumes of data in minutes. So that's a, a brief summary of investigate, and I hope you check out um, more of its capabilities. I, another product where we're applying machine learning is Fortify. Um, so switching gears from the Security Operations Center to another area, which is application security, um, we're embedding machine learning into Fortify for static code analysis. So Darren, can you go to the next slide? So static application security testing um, and the tools that support it report findings of potential vulnerabilities in an application by using different types of analysis methods like taint, structure, and control flow analysis. Then export auditors are required to validate those findings using details specific to that enterprise, um, such as the context of the application and the deployment, when auditors determine a potential software security vulnerability, it's not an issue. Uh, that's not an issue. The, the, the time spent on that verification is non-value added time. It's a waste of time when you have all these false positives. So Audit Assistant identifies relevant exploitable vulnerabilities and it's doing it and, and you know, looking at the scan results and employing machine learning classifiers that are trained using anonymous metadata from scan results that have previously been done and audited by software security experts. So that provides you that good baseline. And the scan analytics platform delivers this capability as a web service uh, in the cloud, enriching um, Fortify SCA, which is our static code analysis tool, uh, its scan results with audit predictions that are up to 98% accurate. Um, greatly reducing the chore of dealing with false positives. So hopefully you can see from these examples of what we're doing with Investigate, what we've um, been doing with Fortify as far as Audit Assistant, and now with the acquisition of Interset, um, we are really taking analytics seriously, seriously and integrating into our portfolio. And that'll help you find challenging issues um, like the, the exposure you have with serious vulnerabilities like Spectre and uh, meltdown. Darren, back to you. Wow, thanks, Stan. So now you can all see how positioning these two specific microfocus tools can now make you the hunters and not the hunted. That's very interesting. Thanks, Stan. Leading us straight into the next trend. Now you see it, now you don't. This is a topic around visibility. And you don't realize it, but all of us are corporate special forces. And I like to refer to our team as the special forces of our company for a number of reasons. Number one, not many people know we exist. And when we get called in at the last minute, we seem to save the day. But there's another thing that we all do well, and we don't realize it. So I want you all to read this phrase out loud. Read it quickly. Now read it again. Okay, simple enough. Now I want you to read it backwards. Now I've tested this on dozens of people and I tested it on Stan and Anne-Marie earlier. And I'm almost certain most of you didn't see the extra the that I snuck in there. We have a saying in Africa, if it was a snake, it would have bitten you. But us cloud builders and security folk, we see things most people don't see. We are conditioned for it. And if you blink, something might just get past you. So remember, you cannot protect what you cannot see. Now, what created these visibility challenges? So building on from this, over the past you know, deca two decades, the growth of the number of devices and the different types of devices that are out there and the platform diversity. You cannot get agents onto new devices. Some devices just don't have operating systems like we know it, and you cannot write agent-based software for every operating system. It's just unsustainable. Plus, there's the cloud adoption that's created new challenges. So you've got lots of device locations, lots of access points. You've got heterogeneous environments with multiple different vendors, so we're not just you know, everyone's doing one type of uh, um, platform. And then obviously decentralized management. So with the internet, 
making the world a much smaller place, it still makes it very complex to manage when you've got so many locations. And then on our right, and this is key to uh, this trend for visibility this year, OT, operational technology networks, are now blurring the lines with corporate networks. So all those SCADA networks where in industry and manufacturing um, had all their devices, and we're talking also around uh, medical and hospitals with all the EKGs and um, CAT scans and MRIs, these devices are now coming onto our corporate network. And with it, they're bringing even more threats. So as you can see, the visibility and the control gap has completely switched. The more devices that are out there and the type of um, operating system diversity and volume, the less easy it is for us to see it. And that makes it more uh, vulnerable to attack. So like with WannaCry, the world, there were $10 billion worth in losses. The attack surface is increasing. I mean, NotPetya had even 14 billion plus in losses. So to put it into perspective, the more devices and the more distributed your companies get, the more likelihood is the chance of getting hit because you cannot control the sheer scale that is happening today. Now, when I say devices, I'm not talking normal computers like laptops and mobile phones. I'm talking everyday devices that are all around us and are now connected to our corporate networks. These devices, as I mentioned before, they just cannot have agents put on them. They don't have normal operating systems like you and I have come to know. So you can see like medical equipment, um, CCTV cameras, anything that runs a processor. Now, I'm gonna tell you something here that I'm not sure many of you knew, but there is a team in the Israel military called Unit 8200. Now they're an intelligence military unit in Israel that are responsible for collecting signal intelligence and code decryption. This is an amazing unit. They're composed mainly of 18 to 21 year olds because um, uh, all teenagers and that have to go and do military service. And as a result, their shortness of their service period, each one ends up leaving this team and going on to found or create um, a security company in Silicon Valley. So Nir Zuk, the guy from Checkpoint, came from this, this team. And it's been said by the Director of Military Sciences that Unit 8200 is probably the foremost technical intelligence agency in the world and stands on a par with the NSA in everything except scale. Now these guys, found something very interesting, which I wanted to share with you. Why would you need protection against all of those OT devices? Weaponized malware. Now, I was talking to Stan about this earlier, and this is a real, real threat. So firstly, this is a $200 million industry waiting to be tapped. And secondly, remember all those devices I told you about a couple of slides back that are connecting to our networks? Well, there are companies that are actually manufacturing these devices with pre-configured malware built into it. A classic example of this was the Zombie Zero attack, and you're not gonna believe this, but I'll take you through it. So Zombie Zero was an attack that was discovered a few years back. It showed that at least eight companies had been compromised. What made this unique was that the malware had been preloaded onto barcode scanners in China and then sold onto the open, these were wireless barcode scanners, and sold on the open market to global shipping and logistics companies. And once the scanner was installed on the wireless network, it was already on the inside of the perimeter. And the attack against internal um, network entities was initiated automatically, and uh, it used a server block message protocol. And basically, it searched for any server with the word finance in it, and it shipped all that information back to an unknown uh, bad actor. The stolen data was scanned and it, they found it included every piece of information about the item, destination address, source and more. So these are major global shipping and logistics companies that were connect, collected by a botnet. So this is frightening because all these devices that are being sold to the West come with pre-configured malware. Now, Sorry. 
So my question is, how does microfocus help with the visibility of all of this that's out there? Stan? Thanks, Aaron. And, and going back to your original premise or, or point, you know, to get the necessary visibility into these kind of threats, we need more data from the assets that we're trying to protect, right? And we need more security logs, ultimately. You know, you know, see, you know, security data underpins the modern security operation environment. And with that exponential growth of collecting all that data from all those devices you were just talking about, um, that volume and the, the velocity that we're getting from all that data, from all those asset sources, um, the SOC must process this data uh, in an efficient way. Um, because of that volume and the velocity, if they don't do it in an intelligent way, they're just going to be overwhelmed. Um, and so you have to be able to, to, to pull in that data quickly, as well as figure out how you're going to actually process it effectively. Go ahead and go to the next slide, if you would. If you get the security data from the assets that you're trying to protect, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud or your OT environment, IoT, you can then leverage use cases to correlate the event data, and then you get the visibility into the threats so you can then secure your enterprise. Go to the next slide. The ArcSight connector framework supports over 560 different devices, different types of devices. So we can consume and normalize those log records as you get them um, to give you that asset coverage. And again, this includes on-prem, in the cloud, wherever those assets reside. Next slide. And then you can set up use cases in ArcSight ESM to monitor for these threats. And these are threats, for example, you can set up a, a use case for you know, the zombie zero day attack you were talking about, Darren, or uh, specific IoT attack vectors. Um, we've actually pre-built close to 250 different use cases for your use in something we call the ArcSight content brain, and I've provided a link down below. So I really encourage you to check that out as a way of jump-starting the use cases that you want to apply. Um, and this is also the same kind of data that you're getting from your sources that you can feed into your security analytics that we discussed in the previous trend section. So go ahead and go to the next slide. And so the, the results is that you have more coverage for the full attackable space and range for the attack types that you need to monitor for threats. And just to validate, Darren, um, you should be now be on the, uh, go to the next slide, the security operation arc site slide. Yep, I, I am. Is All it not right, great. Right. No, I did. again, I'm having a hard time seeing it. So, um, so you know, it's, this gives you a, a sort of like a logical architecture view of, uh, of arc site. And, you know, it provides you a future ready kind of solution that you're looking for to be able to connect with existing data lakes and analytics platforms and other security technologies that are supporting the SOC. Um, at the bottom, you'll see that set of connectors representing, you know, that has a little call out here, the different types of data sources that we can pull this data in from. Uh, and this ArcSight data platform in Justin has a, a broker technology, this message bus that um, allows you to pull in any source from anywhere and enrich that data um, in real time and provide that up to the analyst. So um, that gives you a perspective of what we're doing with ArcSight and how you can get that visibility that you desperately need to be able to see what the threats are. All right, Darren, back to you. Geez, thanks, Stan. So now you see you don't need eyes to see, you need vision. And part of that vision is getting to know your microfocus tools and positioning them in your arsenal. That was very interesting. Eh? So moving on to the next trend, protect your house. I don't know if you all know, but that's the slogan of Under Armour. And we hear it quite often in the UK, except ours isn't protect your house, it's to protect the crown jewels. And we also hear it in cybersecurity. In the case of data protection today, the proverbial house is huge because it's 
property or perimeter includes bring your own devices, as we mentioned, unstructured data, cloud, and of course, people. And in order to do business in today's tech-savvy world, it's like letting your kids have friends over while you're away, but then their friends bring along other friends who you don't approve of, and they bring alcohol. <laughs> so it just goes out of control. And who's responsible and ultimately liable? You. So what can be done about this? Well, for starters, you could build a wall. <laughs> okay, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, in the olden days, and hopefully it stays that way, in order to protect important things, um, large and cumbersome structures were constructed, like the Great Wall of China. Now, I found this image amusing because the Great Wall of China is now one of the biggest tourist attractions to just about anyone in the world. It's not just there to um, keep people out. And the walls, castles, and other ancient deterrents may have been successful in, in keeping out attackers, but how did it do against small groups of ninjas and internal power structure, struggles and, um, and the like? So single purpose defense mechanisms are generally short-sighted as the security landscape is constantly changing. And then the second image on the right, why well, I've put that there, because it conveys many um, themes that we're talking about that, that's impart, important to guarding data. Like, it clearly states that you're not authorized to be here, then you're not allowed to. And if you do make it in and are caught, then there will be penalties. But we are announcing to you exactly what is guarding the place. So that helps threat actors to find out, well, this is what they've got. They've got a firewall. We know how to get behind it. So it's all protecting your house is all about data protection. So protecting sensitive data as determined by law from compromise and loss, because that's what people trust you to do, right? And I like this cartoon because in this corner, we have firewalls, encryption, antivirus software, etc. And in this corner, we have Dave, human error. So what are we protecting? It's all about information, the data the crown jewels. Now, just like our environmental issues, like plastics, waste, pollution, and energy consumption, the way to solve the problem of information clutter is to find ways to reduce our digital footprint. And that's where data minimalism comes in. And that is a key trend this year. So you need to figure out what data is truly important and what is taking up valuable space. How many copies of the data should be kept? Who should have the data? What is the necessary retention period? And once it's deleted, deleted, is it truly gone? So data, data, data. That's what we all heard about in 2018. GDPR was coming into play. Nobody realized how much people's data was actually worth and how it was used became the cause for concern. So this is the whole thing. But moving forward, people need to trust companies that only use the data they need for what they need it for and storing that data responsibly. And I read somewhere that there's a company that's doing blockchain where you can actually sell your personal data and make money off it to marketing companies. So therefore, um, hackers will no longer need to steal data because companies will be able to buy it from you yourself. And then obviously I was talking about compliance and you, know, you follow the rules, you hide your valuables in a safe in the house. But I'm gonna put this over to you, Stan, and tell us, how MicroFocus is addressing this trend. Thanks, Aaron. And before I get into this specific slide, I just want to go back to your point about data minimization and, and understanding what it is that you, you really do need in your, your, your environment to be able to, to do your, bus, your business or mission. Um, you know, we do have a suite of information management and governance uh, software to help with that so you can actually as you bring that data in, you can classify it appropriately and then apply the appropriate policies to it, some of which could be that you, you know, redact it or you can dig it out of your environment um, if you don't need it. So, it, it, you know, to follow up on that point of minimization, I agree 100% that if you don't need to have that sensitive data in your environment for any processes, then get rid of it. If you do need it, then you need to protect it. Um, and, and we do believe that uh, a key to today's approach, given the fact that the target is the data, 
And the bad guys are looking at all the angles that they can get into as far as getting access to that data and monetizing it, um, is data-centric security. Um, unlike uh, point solutions or those you know, single purpose controls like you were talking about, like that wall or a uh, firewall um, that require, in this case, as far as you know, uh, specific single uh, system-based integrations for securing the data, um, like volume level encryption or trust, transparent data, um, database encryption, um, these traditional data at rest encryption approaches, um, like, like the, uh, the storage encryption, assumes that somebody would potentially steal the media itself. And it's rare that you're going to actually break into a data center and, and steal the media. Um, whereas data-centric security allows for the protection to persist as the data moves from storage to in flight, to in use within applications, or going to a cloud environment. Um, by de-identifying the data elements that are sensitive while keeping subfields de-identified to support business functions, data remains usable to applications without giving up the sensitive bits. So this end-to-end -end process, it removes those gaps where the bad guys can then um, try to get access to that data, um, either by compromising an account of an authorized user and getting access to data because it's now going to be decrypted. Um, and so, you know, the intent is to try to keep that data protected as much as possible in the environment, recognize the bad actors are, are trying to get it no matter how they can. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So micro-focused data security comes from the perspective that, you know, a data breach is, or a breach in general, is not only a possibility, but it's a certainty. If the bad guy wants to get in, they're going to find a way of getting in. No matter if it's in the cloud or on premise or anywhere in between, you know, and, and we focus on the protection of that data wherever it goes. And we apply an approach called format preserving encryption. Um, and that de-identifies the sensitive data at the field level while keeping the format the same. So that data will flow through your databases and applications into the cloud or on-prem um, and keeping it protected. And so that means that the data will flow safely um, into and out of your, your business processes um, and their various workloads um, while even if the bad guy gets in and breaches your environment, um, they're not able to monetize that, that data because it's useless to them. So go to the next slide, if you would. Um, you know, many enterprises, as, as we all know, because we have this, the cloud SIG here, and, um, you know, we're seeing it in the security side, too. They're, they're beginning to craft, you know, hybrid cloud environments that allow these uh, processes to be orchestrated across various execution venues. Um, Migrating to and managing hybrid cloud environments can be complex. And one of the biggest barriers is, you know, the, you know, to this approach of, of a seamless hybrid IT is the inconsistent or poor protection of data workloads moving across these environments. And secure data voltage um, can provide this consistent data protection of structured data while minimizing the need to decrypt and expose the data to these threats. Go ahead and go to the next slide. This is just a, an example of you know, a financial services company that um, wanted to shift their workloads to Azure and AWS. And in this case, they had over 40 different sensitive data elements that they needed to protect due to a, a third party mandate for data protection. And they were able to meet their business objectives with voltage and format preserving encryption uh, to protect their data and meet the third party protection mandates. Um, so this is just one example and we have um, this occurring in healthcare and the payment process side, uh, a variety of different use cases, um, auto industry. Um, and so, you know, take, take a look at how we can leverage uh, this technique of preserving the format of the data elements, but at the same time, providing the protection you need against attack. All right, Darren, back to you. Thanks, Dan. 
So I'm going to be corny and say, so basically to avoid lightning in your clouds, you need to increase the voltage. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Great. So speaking of clouds, let me tell you about the next trend, what I call the black cloud, as we rethink the perimeter. So the traditional perimeter model is now in the past due to P, phishing, compromise within the perimeter, assets, migration to the cloud, storage, obviously we've spoken about that, and then traversal, the boundary of, of boundary by devices. It's not the device that's mobile, it's you. And this is the true, true um, threat of, of data compromise and security breach, is the fact that it's people that are moving around the world not necessarily just the data. So I was telling you earlier about protecting the crown jewels, um, but that is if you know where your data is and who has it. But since people take data in and out of your, your organization, they travel overseas, they go on holiday, and then they also move virtually into clouds, out again from one SaaS application to another, you can quickly see how easy it is to lose track of your data. So what can we do about it? We need to put the perimeter around each user. Instead of just a firewall and protection of your data, like the, the castle around um, the crown jewels, we need to ring fence each and every user. And this is how we're gonna be able to protect what they can see, what they can do, and uh, what they have access to. It's almost like zero trust networking, but this, this is more from an identity perspective. So Stan is gonna now share with us how MicroFocus achieved this. And, and this is a, a bit of a busy slide, but you know, the point is that you know, organizations are undertaking digital transformations, right? And they're trying to support their customers and have um, to put in place identities to um, allow them access. Um, they have partners trusted and untrusted, but they have to be able to um, recognize those partners. And then there's the mobile space. Um, so as we're you know, undertaking these transformations and creating these hybrid IT kind of environments, um, there are, there's lots to, lots to deal with. And as Darren points out, we need to recognize that identities have sort of become the new perimeter. Um, but Many organizations can't effectively scale their identity solutions to meet the demand of this modern environment. What worked before for the smaller, you know, in-house kind of problems that you've got as far as governance of your identities, um, all of a sudden could be broken if you have a, a, a merger or an acquisition and your size increases, you know, the spreadsheets break, right? You need to have something more mature. Uh, to actually be uh, a deal with that. So go ahead and go to the next slide, Darren. And as we look at uh, simplification of that horrendous mapping we talked about a second ago and all the various aspects, we can break it down to manageable bytes when you address it you know, uh, on the identity side. Um, you know, if you have a platform that can support multiple delivery models while essentially managing identities and providing a single view, um, that's, that's going to be key to success as far as how you can actually make this work. So go ahead and go to the next slide. You know, from, from our view, the, the, we break this down into three specific but connected facets. Um, identity governance and administration, access management, and then privilege management. Um, you know, I think, you know, if you look at our portfolio, that's a broad grouping as far as how you can um, consider the different aspects of the portfolio, and they're all working together. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So if you combine these three facets uh, and overlap and working together, uh, you know, a form of complete access assurance is sort of created. And um, you know, what you want to ultimately achieve, if you click through this, Darren, to, to, to build out the slide, um, is ultimately 
making sure that the right people have the right access to the right things at the right time and with the right experience. I mean, that's ultimately what we're trying to accomplish here is, you know, as we're governing the users as well as the non-carbon based entities in the environment, um, uh, you want to be able to ensure that they have the proper access and only the right access that they need at that uh, to perform the, the function and the job that they need to do. And so if you look at the last slide, um, you know, we have a, a significantly more pieces of the identity access management solution than um, most other vendors out there in the space. And, and because we're integrating, you know, the sum provides a greater value than the individual parts. Um, and we're continuing to do this integration and continuing to deepen and provide greater value uh, for our customers. So that's certainly what we're trying to do is enable you to, you know, again, govern your identity space, whether it be a, um, your employees or your consumers, um, provide the right kind of access management, and then knowing what the bad guys are trying to do, which is privilege escalation many times, is when they get in through a phishing attack, they want to escalate the privilege. Um, you got to manage those that have privilege and those non-human entities, non-carbon based entities in your environment that have entitlements and privilege effectively uh, to ensure that you're actually monitoring that as well as controlling that kind of access. All right, Darren, next slide. So I was just going to laugh there, your non-carbon based entities. Yes, non-carbon based entities. <laughs> So there you can see another one more to add to your arsenal. And um, I was just going to say, Stan, before you go into the next one there, that everyone, you can see just how a few of the tools of MicroFocus can address some of these key trends. But it's always best when they all work together. What do you reckon, Stan? No, I agree. I mean, it's one of those things where um, I think we're all striving for better integration of tool sets because single point solutions that, uh, you know, don't, integrate are, are, are challenging even if they're best to breed because um, we end up with all these different point solutions that you're trying to, to to deal with i mean it's a lot of the organizations that we talk to have 50 to 100 different security solutions in their environment and the engineering and operations of all those solutions is a huge challenge um, and if you can have better integration um, within the the a suite of products that's, that's certainly the desired state. Gosh, thank yeah. you. No, that's so, so this last slide, yeah, so this last slide, Darren, you know, again, I, I just want to thank you and, and Vivid for the opportunity to participate in this, this joint webinar with the cloud and security stakes. And, you know, I, I touched upon a number of these products, but um, this gives you a, a, the, the specific mapping of what the products are that support these different cybersecurity technology areas um, and how they can support some of the trends that Darren teed up. Um, but as you're looking to transform your environments and, you know, uh, are looking to secure them, um, MicroFocus is there to help you. Um, so um, hopefully we have some time for some questions, Darren. And, and um, looking forward to it. No, really appreciate uh, you being here, Stan, and giving us some of those insights from the world of microfocus. And uh, so everyone, that, that was almost up. So we have a few moments left for, for any questions, if anyone has them. But also, if anyone's interested, we're, we're going to be following on from this by hosting a few demos of each of the specific products that Stan has touched upon in this session. So please watch this space and join us for another exciting webinar brought to you by, by Vivit. So now, thanks, Dan, again. Um, if you just stick around, we're going to see if there's any questions. Or, as I always like to, to see it, we've covered off everything in, in such detail that the, they're either so shocked by our content or they have no questions because we've managed to answer them ahead of the time. 
Hey there. And, um, well, I uh, have kept an eye on the uh, questions. There's um, uh, at least one came in uh, right now. And um, so it uh, says, how do we make the security products from Microfocus relevant to the cloud architects and data center automation teams? So, yeah, I mean, as I was talking about with data protection, I think one of the big stumbling blocks historically for moving workloads to the cloud um, has been the security team being concerned about how sensitive data is going to be protected in cloud environments. And so the, the architects need to be cognizant of that whole uh, data flow and govern the data appropriately and provide the right kind of access controls and protection um, to the data that, that's supporting that uh, environment. Uh, so I think that's a, a big aspect. Another one, as we've talked about, is identities. You know, how do you ensure that um, the, the uh, multi-factor authentication, the identity governance is, is being applied as they're architecting the solution? Um, and, you know, I think that uh, as we've talked about, the new perimeter truly is the identity. Um, and, and that needs to be something that they're working into their requirements and their design. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. So, anything you want to add, Darren? No, I'm going to just echo what Stan was saying, and that um, even though you might not be a security labeled individual, you have to be cognizant of security throughout every step of the process. As hopefully these trends have shown you, that security is no longer just a, a nice to have, it goes without saying. You've got, um, I mean, we can do a whole webinar just on DevSecOps where you you embed security in the application itself. But because of the type of um, threat vectors that are out there, and especially with what I showed you all today with weaponized malware, everyone is part of the the, um, the task. Like when there's a fire, it's not just one person's problem, it's everyone's problem. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, there's a question that came in from Gary. Uh, are corporations developing counterintelligence capabilities? Can you say anything about that? I'll let Darren address that one first. So your company is developing counterintelligence? Or our no, companies? Our companies. Uh, our corporations developing counterintelligence capabilities. Yeah. Yes, so there's a, a number, I mean, I can only speak for, for example, for my company, I work for Accenture, and we have um, a whole incident response team threat intelligence platform using um, Fusion X and Cyber Fusion, and they have access into uh, a vast array of, of data that comes from micro-focus analytics, as well as the next generation firewall analytics, and they're developing, um, you know, solutions based on all the information that's available and especially you know we can even mention um, like what, what Google's looking to do you know you have to have access to all of the the information otherwise you cannot make those decisions so that's my view on it and, and, Stan, I, and I think I, I guess I counterintelligence having come from so I, I got my start at, at the National Security Agency and that has a certain meaning to me. In, in the cyberspace, I think it's really more threat intelligence. Um, and with that awareness of what campaigns are being run by the bad actors, what, um, you know, as you threat model your, your systems and understand the potential attack vectors, and then map that to what you're seeing as far as the act, active campaigns and the kind of threats you're seeing, um, you can pivot your controls and be more adaptive um, to those threats. And organizations are standing up and, and sharing threat data with each other, um, threat intel with each other, so they can be more, um, uh, apply the right controls to the threat that they're seeing. And you mentioned Google. Google is, is really good at doing that kind of pivoting where they're actually seeing certain threats and then they're applying the controls that they need to to address those threats. That helps them prioritize, um, you know, specifically what uh, they need to be focusing on. I do want to address that there's another question, Anne Marie, that was in the chat uh, about the credit card data in the example. And 
you know, just to clarify, yes, you would want to collect, you want to protect the, the credit card data. And many times it's honestly with tokenization um, for PCI compliance versus format preserving encryption. Um, for PCI, uh, they are, they're, they're, they're requiring tokenization. Um, you can, uh, in certain circumstances, certainly use format preservers, preserving encryption um, for uh, your credit card data. And in some cases, then, um, you know, leave subfields like the last four digits uh, decrypted so that um, your help desk or other business processes can uh, continue to operate without having to decrypt that data. So depending on the use case, whether it's a PCI use case and therefore tokenization or other use cases, you'd apply different kinds of protections to the, the, card, the credit card hand field. Great, thank you, Stan, for, uh, for answering that question as well. Um, I don't see any other questions uh, from the audience right now, and we're almost at the top of the hour. So um, with that, I would like to thank both of you uh, for a very interesting uh, session. Uh, I do have some uh, information for you. Uh, there are some upcoming Vivid events. There's a, a local user group meeting in Germany coming up. Uh, March 20. Uh, so in, if you are in the network management space, then um, I would recommend you to uh, look at this uh, link. And uh, a webinar, March 28, Automated Monitoring Develops Golden Data. Automated uh, AI Ops with OpsBridge makes it shine. So that's the upcoming event for this month. Um, register today uh, for Universe 2019, it's coming up uh, 26 to 28 March. You'll benefit from customer-driven content to give you real-world tips, tricks, and best practices, one-on-one -on -one meetings with micro-focused leaders and product managers, educational workshops, a private hosted dinner, and more. Microfocus Universe is invaluable to all roles, from business executives to technical users and everyone in between. So I hope to see you there. Vivid will have a booth, so welcome to uh, come by. ADM Summit, registration is now open for this Microfocus ADM Summit, April 9 to 11 in Rosemont, Illinois, Chicago area. Uh, join Vivid there to learn how global competition is demanding innovative apps that meet all customer expectations. The Microfocus application delivery management product management team will conduct compelling breakout sessions, share the latest product roadmaps and demo their newest solutions. Attendees will have the opportunity to network with peers, partners, product experts, and ADM executives. We hope you can join us. Hey, Henry, I just want to add one more thing. Um, we, we also have the Cybersecurity Summit uh, for Microfocus that will be in Dallas this year as opposed to in the D.C. area. Uh, that will be in June. So I think it's the 6th through the 9th wow. in, in oh, Dallas, okay. Texas. So hopefully you guys can mark that on your calendars. Yeah, great, uh, Ed. Uh, thank you, Stan. Uh, so the Security Summit, and that will be in Dallas, you said, in June. Great. Okay, I'll make sure to uh, to yeah to promote that in the next uh, event. So uh, thank you, Stan, and thank you, Darren, for your presentation. And uh, we appreciate your time uh, to share your knowledge and. Uh, um, all your experience with the Vivid members. Thank you, Vivid members, for attending today's uh, Vivid SIG webinar. And um, uh, thank you, thank you also for giving us the opportunity. And I hope that our insights into um, the trends in the, the world of cybersecurity has given you guys some food for thought and how um, Stan's managed to map the um, uh, appropriate microfocus tools to those trends. Thank you, Stan. Great. Oh, yeah. thank you, Darren, and thank you, Anne Marie. Thank you both. And uh, uh, just a reminder that you will receive a, a short, short, short survey after this webinar, and we would love to get your feedback. Um, and uh, well, thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Now.